I don't know about you, but I am so thankful uh, for that reckless love of God. And I heard that song a few years ago, and uh, it just really stuck in my heart. And I think every time I watch it or I listen to it now, uh, the phrases that talk about the lengths that God goes to, okay, uh, to show us just how much we are loved, I think is just so, so powerful. So hopefully uh, God's reckless uh, love is just really, really close uh, to you today. Now this morning, I'm going to continue on in our little series that I've entitled The Basics of Ecclesiology. And last week, I defined ecclesiology as the study or theology that's pertaining to the nature and structure of the Christian church. And when I talk about the Christian church, I'm not just talking about the independent Christian churches that self-work is a part of. I'm really talking about all of the churches who aren't aligned and structured uh, along the lines of the Catholic church. I encourage you to use the word ecclesiology, okay, in one of your conversations this week. Did anybody try to do that? I tried to drop it into one. And people just looked at me like, what'd you say? And uh, you know, they didn't give me the response I wanted, which was, is this a COVID symptom? Um, they didn't give me that. But um, again, try it this week, okay? If you're in a conversation with somebody, just say, you know, I think the ecclesiology of this is, and just look at their face, okay? I, I think you'll enjoy the moment. And last week in Ecclesiology 101, we talked about the very high bar that has been set for those who serve as elders in the local church. And we also talked about why that bar has to be so high. The reason is because there are three roles that elders play in the church, that of helmsman and shepherd and trustee, that require them to be above reproach. Today, in Ecclesiology 102, I want to look at another group of leaders that's talked about in the New Testament that has a different type of leadership in the church. Whereas elders are given oversight over all of the ministry of the church, what I want to talk about today are those gifted leaders, okay, whose role is very specific in the local church. Here at South Fork, we call them ministry team leaders. Historically, they may have been called deaconess, deacons or deaconesses, and what their role is is that they are a servant leader, meaning that they are serving leaders, but they're also leading other servants. Raise your hand if you've ever built a new house. Okay, have you ever been through the process of building a house? Okay, a few of you will really probably be able to relate to what I'm going to share next. Because what this process, if you've driven by our place, you, you've seen that our house is slowly taking shape. Okay, one thing I'm learning about this is I don't have as much patience as I thought I did. Because I really wanted it to be done quickly. And there's nothing quick about building a house. But the, the, the process has been so incredible to watch. It really has. Unlike in the old days where maybe there were just a handful of people who did all of the different roles and parts of the construction process, today there are so many specialists, so many people who specialize in a, sp a particular trade that I knew I couldn't handle overseeing all of them. So we hired a general contractor, okay, whose job it is to keep track of everything and to make sure that things are done the way that we want them done. Now, it all started, okay, with this guy who came out in the middle of May with his little GPS tracking device and started driving stakes and putting flags in the ground. He was the one who mapped out where the foundation of the house was supposed to go. And he had to be very exact because we had already ordered some trusses and some other uh, parts of the house that had to fit exactly on the foundation that he was laying out. Then came the guy who dug the hole, okay? Comes in with this big excavator with this little device on it or whatever that tells him exactly how deep to dig. And it was amazing to watch that process. Then came those guys who back in, you know, unlike it is now, back in May, it was really muddy. And so they're trompsing around in the mud digging footing, okay, so that the foundation for the foundation could be laid. Then they put up these big forms and poured concrete in them, and it started to take shape, and it was pretty exciting. And then came the framers, okay? The framers, I just loved watching. Because here is a group of guys who are taking sticks of wood, and cutting them in exact lengths and putting them together so that the rooms that we want in our house are exactly the shape and the size that we want them to be. Well, they finally got done, and along came this 
crew of electricians and plumbers and heating and cooling people whose job it is to put the infrastructure into the house so that we can actually live in it someday. This past week, they started insulating everything. And Lord willing, maybe, if I'm patient, drywallers may actually come in the next few days and start making those stick rooms into real rooms. Once they're done, the carpenters will come back in and they will finish all of the trim and put the doors in and all that stuff and prepare it so that hopefully the flooring people can come in and Sharon won't have to walk on plywood floors and get splinters in her feet. Every step has involved people with different skills and different abilities. And if it weren't for the general contractor kind of overseeing them and making sure that the plan was being followed, who knows what we would end up with. If you've been through the process, you know how fun it is, because it really is fun. But it's also challenging. Sure, and I look forward to the day when our mobile mansion becomes mobile once again and can become the home to someone else, and that we can actually open up our new home and have you come in and celebrate with us God's goodness. But again, the only way that's going to happen is if everyone who has a specific job to do does their job. If you think about it, that's just the same in the church. We've talked before about how in the Bible, instead of using a construction metaphor, which is used in some parts, when Paul talks about the church, he uses the imagery of the human body, and he talks about how every part of the body has a role to play in order for that body to function. As we saw last week, the elders are those who oversee and who lead. I would say that probably the elders are kind of like the general contractors, okay, if we wanted to switch back to that metaphor. They oversee how things get done in the church. But really, the job of getting the jobs done and the ministries done rests on the shoulders of some people who are servant leaders who have been given very specific tasks. So the first thing that we need to note about those servant leaders or ministry team leaders or deacons, however you want to refer to them, is that they have a very specific area of ministry that they do in the church. Most of the thinking about deacons and ministry team leaders really comes from an event that we read about in the book of Acts that took place about five years into the life of the church, okay? The church began on the day of Pentecost. We know that, right? Acts chapter 2. And for the next five years, it grew very quickly and it developed. And part of of what happened was there were some growing pains. There were some structural issues that came into play in this new church that had to be worked out. So turn with me to Acts chapter 6, if you would, and let's look at verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Luke says this, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, meaning both sides were happy with this. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and the number of priests who became obedient to the faith also grew. Now, if you were paying close attention as you were reading this or as I was reading it, what word did you not hear me say when I was talking about these seven men? I didn't say the word deacon, did I? The reason is the word diakonos, which is the word that the Greek word that we translate into English as deacon or servant, isn't found any place in the book of Acts. Diakonos is not in that book. 
In fact, the closest that you come to it is diakonia, which is translated ministry, which is used twice in this passage when it talks about the ministry that the apostles were doing. What we read is there was this need in the church, and seven men were chosen to meet this need. Two of these men we read about later in the book of Acts, don't we? We read about Stephen almost immediately in the next chapter, and then we read about Philip in the chapter after that. Let me give you a Bible trivia question, okay? If you're ever playing Bible trivia with somebody and you want to go for the win, Prochorus, okay? Does anybody know anything about him? He was one of these seven that was chosen in Acts chapter 6, but you know what? He also became very attached to the Apostle John, and most people believe that it was Prochorus that the Apostle John dictated the fourth gospel to, and he's the one who actually wrote it down. So if somebody says, who wrote the book of John? You could say, Prochorus did. And go for the win, okay, in Bible trivia. Nobody was impressed with that? I thought everybody would be going, oh, got to make note of that. Okay, well, okay, whatever. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4, okay? Because it says in Acts chapter 4, we've looked at this before, that everyone's need was being met. We're five years into the development of this church And there seems to be some competition that began to exist between the Greek and the Hebrew Jews. Both sects, okay, both sides had become followers of Jesus, but the Greek uh, Jews were saying that the Hebraic Jews were overlooking their widows in the daily distribution of food. And so what they did was they didn't let it become an issue. They brought it before the 12 apostles. And I love what they did, okay? I just love what the apostles did in this particular case because what they didn't do was drop everything that they were doing and start serving food. They didn't stop ministering and overseeing the church and just serving food to those Grecian widows. They said, no, you know what? We've got our job to do. You go find seven men who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. So they're saying you need spiritual and smart people, okay? to lead these ministries. I think it's interesting to note that out of those seven names, all seven of them are Greek. All seven men who were chosen have Greek descendants, come from Greek descendants, Greek ancestors, and they also then probably were the ones who were closest to those widows, and so it really made a lot of sense, doesn't it? Would they be the ones who were doing that work? You can't miss what Luke also says in verse 7. When he says, the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Why was that? Because the elders or the apostles, in this case, were doing what they were called to do, and these men then did the specific ministry that they were called to do. You know, even though the title deacon is not used in this passage, most people think that this is probably one of the stories that the apostle Paul used to put together his structure for elders and deacons in the church that he wrote to Timothy about. One thing we have to keep in mind, okay, when we look at the word deacon, it's a transliteration, okay? Basically, you're just taking an English word and putting it with a Greek, uh, an English letter, putting it with a Greek letter, and it transliterates the diakonos, okay, to deacon. If you really want to translate the word, transliteration is deacon. If you want to translate the word, it's servant table waiter, or runner. All three of those terms are used to describe what we typically call deacons. It conveys the idea that there's something very specific that they've been given to do. There aren't too many people in the New Testament who are given the title of deacon, but there's one that I think we need to make note of, and it's found in Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Look at what Paul says. He says, I commend to you our sister, Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centurion. Guess which word he uses that's translated servant there? Diakonos. It's the female form. So basically, he's saying she's a deaconess. So The role wasn't limited to just males in the New Testament. Phoebe was a servant, a deaconess, who was doing some specific ministry in her home church. 
Like I said, there's not a lot of people who are identified that way because most of the time people are just groups if they're serving in that capacity. And deacons are oftentimes associated with bishops and or elders. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul says this, as he addresses the letter, he says, to all of the saints in Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers or elders and deacons. You know what? It didn't take very long for this servant deacon role to achieve a lot of status and power in the early church. In fact, the next generation of apostolic leadership, those early church fathers, people like Clement and Ignatius, would write about the office of deacon and sometimes how powerful that office became that the deacons became more powerful than the elders because they were the ones who actually controlled the purse strings can you see some of the problems that that would make in a church if that was the case i remember my first ministry experience in decatur there was a board of elders and there was a board of deacons and occasionally they would meet together, okay, like once a month or once a quarter or something like that because the elders were the ones who were really making the decisions, but they would meet with the deacons, the board of deacons, and come together primarily to make sure that all of the needs of the deacons were communicated to the elders so that the ministry was getting done. That was back in the early 80s, 1980s. For those of you who are young, it's not 1880s, it's 1980s. I'm not that old. Since that time, most churches, okay, that I'm aware of have moved away from having a combined board of elders and deacons to more of what South Fork does, whereas the New Testament model where elders are the ones who steer, shepherd, and steward the church, and then those servant leaders are the ones who do specific ministries. In a couple of weeks, we hope to be able to share with you some of the changes that we're proposing to our bylaws that are going to note this change that has really been happening here at South Fork for a long time. But we think we need to align our bylaws with our practices, which is our ministry team leaders are doing specific ministry tasks. When we give those to you, we'll give you a chance to, to study them and ask us questions. And then probably sometime before the end of the year, we'll have a congregational meeting where we'll ask you to approve those. But just trying to let you know ahead of time some of the stuff that's going to be coming. But you know, with all those changes, there's, not gonna, there's gonna be some things that aren't gonna change. And that's gonna be the desired characteristics that we're looking for in people who serve in this role. Back in Acts chapter six, the apostles looked for people who were full of the spirit and full of wisdom. The apostle Paul really fleshed that out a little bit more when he wrote to Timothy. It's one of the passages that we looked at last week. It just continues on. Turn to first Timothy chapter three, if you would. And here Paul gives us some of those desired characteristics for those servant leaders. He says, likewise, or he says, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have uh, served well gain an excellent standing and gain assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at verse 11 just a little bit more, okay, where it says the wives of deacons. Does your, translate, does your Bible have a little footnote there? It also says that that same word can be translated women. Likewise, women are to be. And then maybe there's another footnote that says insert the word deaconess there. I think based upon what Paul said in Romans chapter 16, where Phoebe is listed as a deaconess, as a servant, what he's saying is these characteristics are for men and women who serve as servant leaders in the church. But note this about both. They both begin with the same quality or the same characteristic, do they not? That is, they need to be worthy of respect. They have to be honorable. Last week I suggested that above reproach and blamelessness was the 
umbrella for elders that all of those other characteristics really fit under. And I want to suggest to you today that this idea of being worthy of respect is that same umbrella for the deacons or those ministry team leaders who serve in the church. And they're worthy of respect because look at the things that they do that Paul goes on to say. They're sincere. They're not indulging in much wine. They're not pursuing dishonest gain or holding, and they are holding to the deep truths of the faith. They have a clear conscience. They're not malicious talkers. They're temperate, trustworthy, loyal to their spouse, and leaders of their own household. I don't know about you, but anybody who does all of those things, in my mind, is worthy of respect and needs to be leading in Christ's church. I think it's important for servants to, to uh, servant leaders to possess these qualities because their actions are a reflection of Christ. Their actions are a reflection of the church. Verse 13, Paul said, those who serve well gain an excellent standing. I don't think that's just a standing within the church. I think that's a, a standing in the community as well. Because you know what? When people exhibit these qualities, especially in our world, People will notice them. I don't know about you. I don't know how you respond when you hear of Christian leaders whose sin has become public and broadcast all over the place. But for me, it's really upsetting. Not because I'm good from any stretch of the imagination. I am so far from sinless that I refuse to throw any stones at any evangelist or preacher or elder or deacon. But the longer I serve in ministry, the more committed I am that those who lead in the church or in a Christian organization need to be above reproach and worthy of respect. When the news came out a few weeks ago about the actions of a leader of a well-known Christian university and his wife, my heart broke, not because I had any affinity necessarily to them, but because I knew what was going to happen. People are going to use their example and point once again to the church and talk about how hypocritical we are and that we say one thing and that we do another. And then when one of my favorite Christian apologists passed away and then there comes out stories that are seemingly being verified about a central side of him that he subjected people around him to some very inappropriate things, my heart broke just again. And I read it in a Christian magazine that I read all the time. And I'm like, why would they do this? Why would they make this known about this man that was so revered? And they even wrote an article to answer my question. Not because I asked it, but because other people asked it. And what they said made me just tears come to my eyes, but it also made me say, you know what, they're right. For way too long, the church has just looked the other way and tolerated leaders who were not above reproach are worthy of respect. And all that's done is it creates conflict and conflicts in people's minds who are looking for something different in this world that they can believe in and hold on to. As much as we want to blame someone as, as a church that someone else is doing certain things to us, I'm becoming more and more convinced that all we have to do is look in the mirror as a church. And that's why we are in the position that we're in. For me, it's really how much evidence is in a person's life about how dependent they are on God's grace. I suggested last week that elders couldn't even come close to being blameless if, it, if they haven't accepted God's grace and rely on it every minute of their lives. I think the same can be true of deacons or ministry team leaders. The only way that they know deep down inside that they are worthy of respect is because of God's grace. They know that God respected them enough that he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross so that every sin they committed and or will commit and confess and repent of can be forgiven. They take full advantage of the gift. And then they strive to live according to God's plan. We ask you every now and then to look for people who you think God has prepared to serve in different roles in the church. Sometimes we look for people who are really good. 
their lives are all together. They've got all the pieces together. Not me. I look for people whose lives are broken and who understand God's grace and who understand that if it weren't for God's grace, they wouldn't even be able to stand. And they have accepted that grace, and more than anything, what they want to do is to pour that grace into other people's lives. Because my thought is this. Legalistic expectations don't motivate people to follow Christ. But grace does. I'm so thankful for the men and women who serve as servant leaders here at South Fork. Because I can look at each one of their lives and I see an understanding of God's grace. I know that when Barb O'Brien leads our worship ministry, she does so because she wants people to feel and experience God's grace. I know that Kathleen Wintholz and Shirley Ayers before her as they lead the missions team, the reason they want to do that is because they want people all over this globe to hear the gospel message about God's grace. When people are in need of grace through prayer, I know that Donna Tucker is one of the first people to extend that grace to them through prayer, and every single request is is taken to God, seeking his grace. Kevin Coltis, even as an accountant, okay, which is amazing, even as an accountant, he and his wife Lori understand just how important grace is that when somebody is in need, that we have the resources to be able to share that with them as they lead our angel ministry. Kathy Coker leads our body life ministry, and she does that so that we can be gracious to one another and to the community. My wife Sharon wants to make sure that every child in our children's ministry hears the gospel so that one day they can accept God's grace. Those who do other ministries in the church, whether it it, it be Tracy or Lynn or anybody else working with Operation Christmas Child, anybody else, the reason we do this is it's because of God's grace. We've experienced it. And we want to extend it. I think that's the message from Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we're so blessed as a church to have men and women who are servant leaders, who are worthy of respect, and that we can lift them up and honor them. But just as I said with elders last week, We need the next generation of servant leaders to be preparing themselves, making themselves worthy of respect so that when there is a specific need in this church, we can point to them and say, we need you to do this task. And they're ready to serve. Building a house, I'm learning, requires a lot of different skills and a lot of different people. Building this church, continuing to build this church, takes just as many, if not more, people to do the ministries that God has prepared you to do. May we do so in a way that is worthy of respect and that honors God. Would you pray with me about that?